Okay, 12 minutes isn't long, so I'm going to whip along here. Hello, thank you very much for inviting me along here today to talk about data journalism. I'm going to talk about data journalism and data projects at the BBC from an editorial perspective, so I'm not talking about uh, technical developments or the types of uh, 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 things that we use. You'll be going into that tomorrow, I think. Um, so first, um, first off, a bit of an introduction. Uh, my team is uh, about five journalists, about eight journalists, five developers, and five designers. You may think that's very large, but we also uh, do all sorts of projects, uh, basically with the graphics team as well. So we do information graphics, uh, daily charts. We work with up to 20 teams across the newsroom at BBC News in London. And we also do um, bigger uh, information graphics interactive projects as well. Uh, our, our projects can originate with any one of the people on that specials team, as we call them. Oh, sorry, any one of that, uh, any one of that team, or any journalist across the newsroom. They'll come and see us too, uh, if they want to uh, do a data project. Um, so, and that's where you can see our stuff. Um, first up, I'll talk about the sort of people that you need. Um, the very important thing is to actually have people who are really interested in news when you're working on data projects, not just people who are interested in data. Um, because it's all about finding the stories in the data. Uh, so you need a range of people with a range of skills. And you can do it in many different ways. You don't necessarily have to have uh, people who are uh, the new breed of um, uh, sort of journalist developers, although it's really good if you do, and and that can be, you know, and that's something that we're moving towards. But in lots of newsrooms, there are people who come from different backgrounds and who work together. So you might have experienced investigative journalists working with developers, working with UX designers to produce really good content. Journalists, at the very least, need to be numerate. They need to have a basic understanding of statistics. Um, they need to be able to use Excel, you know, uh, uh, Google Fusion Tables, uh, various visualization tools online. Um, and if they don't, a willingness to really learn that if they've got some expertise that they're already bringing to the process. Uh, a bit about process. If you're running these projects, if it's anything longer than a week, uh, it's very important. You may not have a product manager or a project manager, but it's very important to... Uh, somebody fulfills that role. So have a kickoff meeting, set out what you're trying to achieve, your main objectives, um, uh, your kind of requirements, uh, make sure you have frequent chats, make sure somebody's documenting it all, and, uh, and uh, keep going in that way. And also the very important thing is if you're working with people from different disciplines, it's really important to sit together if you can, because otherwise you'll waste a lot of time misunderstanding each other on email. Um, so... First up, I'm going to talk about different sorts of data journalism. There's three sorts, basically, that, that I kind of uh, think about in BBC News terms, and these are mirrored in the recent Data Journalism Awards as well. There's traditional investigative data journalism, or formerly called computer-assisted reporting, where you're finding stories in the data. It doesn't necessarily have to involve visualizations, but it can. Secondly, there's using data to tell a story um, uh, or explain something complex. That will involve visualizations normally. Um, and thirdly, there's using data to provide a service or a tool that gives somebody some personally relevant information. That sort of thing can be uh, a tax calculator or possibly um, you'll be familiar with school report, uh, uh, school report tables. And so you can find out about your individual school. We've done those as well. Um, I'll move on to some examples now that might help to inspire you. And I'm happy to talk about these later in the day or any others. They're not perfect. I mean, nothing we ever do is perfect, but I just thought I'd pull these out. Um, this is uh, one that we worked on with uh, Panorama Team, which is the current affairs program at the BBC in London. London. Um, it merged out of uh, people, merged out a couple of years ago, uh, midway through the economic crisis, or two years into it anyway. Uh, there was lots of concern about how much public sector workers, top level public sector workers, were being paid. And there was discussion about, you know, and, and, and statements that nobody should be paid more than the Prime Minister, who's paid about £140,000, but he also gets a couple of free houses as well. So, so anyway, um, Panorama partnered up with the Centre for Investigative Journalism in uh, London, and uh, they 
FOI'd, put in freedom of information requests to lots of public sector organisations to find out how much all their top people were paid. And they got lots and lots of data. Uh, and actually, all the information, is, they asked for everything over £100,000. Excuse me, this information hadn't come out before. Um, and as it turned out, not surprisingly, a lot of people were paid more than the Prime Minister. Um, although he gets other perks as well, obviously. And uh, we worked with Panorama only at the very last minute. So they came to us saying, we've got lots of time. Our transmission date's in two weeks. So you know, there was a vast amount of data. And we had to work out very quickly how to do something with it online. And uh, we divided it into categories. And um, we pulled out the top tens for each category. And we also allowed people to explore the data. We probably want to do it in a better way now, actually. But we had to do it very quickly. And, uh, and you know, it was really interesting. We, um, it was a pretty big story, partnered with the TV documentary, and uh, I got a few hundred thousand page views. Um, and I think it was probably before we were really measuring shares, but lots of people kept coming back to it. Mostly, it seemed, from uh, government uh, URLs, actually, to check how much their bosses were being paid. So uh, that, was, that might offer you inspiration. There's other, you know, that could certainly travel to different countries, I think. Uh, the other thing which this revealed was that um, data takes a really long time to process. You, if you FOI for data, put in a freedom of information request, which I know you can't do here, it sounds like it's something really good, but what you can get back is data in lots and lots and lots of different formats. And so to have to process all that can take a very long time. You know, there'll be errors in the data. You will then create more errors in the data when you put it into spreadsheets. And then you'll have to um, go through that. And uh, so it can take months. It does take months to do. Um, moving on. Uh, so this is another small project which we did, which took less time. So the Panorama project, I'd say, in all took about seven months, but just two weeks of my team's time. This one took, uh, I guess, the, it's information, the data comes from the BBC Urdu service, and they were tracking uh, drone attacks and um, Islamic militant attacks in Pakistan. And uh, they, uh, we had all the locations and the number of people who were killed. And the intention was to see if there was a link between the two. But actually, it didn't seem that apparent. It, just, it was just interesting to sort of show the data over a period of time and also to compare it with previous data, which um, uh, showed that the uh, number of drone attacks had, under Obama had gone up. So this covers about 18 months up to about uh, uh, June 2010. So... Uh, it was a small project, it was a distinct project, um, and it was quite easy to do. It had kind of very clear parameters, and so that's quite important when you're working with data, that you think up front about what you're going to do with it, because otherwise you can kind of get lost in it, and it can go on for a very long time. Um, this is a project which I really like. It's there to give you another bit of inspiration. Um, it's, from, uh, it's one of the recent winners at the Data Journalism Awards. Um, the reason why I like this data, is it, this project, is because it, it does the, the two things that you really need to do with data projects. Is it does, it's got effective visualizations, but also it makes the stories personal and it has case studies. Uh, numbers themselves are very difficult to sell to people. People aren't really that interested in them. Only in so far as there are stories that affect people, right? So whenever you do this story, a data story, it's always very useful to have um, uh, and important to tell the story from individual perspectives. So this, you can see at the top, we spoke to a drone pilot. Uh, and we also spoke to people who are actually in Pakistan who are being affected by these attacks. Um, so it's not just the data, it's much more than that. Uh, have a look at this online. It's really interesting. They use, um, to make things quick, you know, they use Tableau for the visualizations and they use Document Cloud uh, for the documents to annotate the documents. Um, it's just a, it's a really interesting and really good piece of work. And this took, to stress about time with data journalism projects, there's two things which I think. One is that they can take a really long time and two is that uh, you need to make them more interesting than just the numbers. This took about 10 months and five people, so I've read. Um, moving on to a project that uh, my team did, a journalist called Adrian Brown um, did, who, which is uh, not strictly investigative journalism project, it's more of a data visualization, sort of telling a story type data project. Whereas we um, FOI'd for data relating to uh, road deaths and road casualties in Britain, 
we wanted to uh, see where they were happening, see if there were any patterns in the data. It was a very, very big data set. Um, initially, uh, we, there's, there was an academic institution which held it, but they didn't want to release it to us because we wanted to do things with the data that uh, they weren't very happy with, which was link the individual accidents to uh, stories in newspapers about those accidents where they'd occurred. So then we had to put in freedom of information requests for it to the Department of Transport. Eventually we got it, and then after that they became a bit freer about releasing the data, and now the data's kind of more available to anybody who wants it, and other people have used it. Um, so what we did was we plotted uh, all the deaths that occurred over about 12 years, and people can search this by postcode or by local authority. And this was very popular, by far the most popular aspect of the project, actually, in terms of uh, user response. It got a few million page views and continues to be pretty well shared. And people use it. Um, but we did lots of other things, too. And so that's another tip here, is that actually... You know, you can, you can have loads of brilliant ideas, but you need to decide, you know, what resources you have and what are you going to be able to deliver. Because, uh, as I said, you know, 10 months is a long time for a project. If you look at um, the... So the Washington Post did a data journalism project called Top Secret America, which took them two years to do. Okay, so, so you need to think about what you're going to be able to, to deliver in a time. And we tend to work on projects with about, you know, we have... We do short things, which are like a day, longer things, which are about a week, and then a bit longer, which is about up to a month. And we don't tend to spend much more time than that on projects. Although you can take the research period out of that. So, so as well as plotting all these deaths, we also, um, uh, we also visualize some key stats that are coming out of it. So, for example, you could look at motorcyclists and uh, see how much more likely they were to die. Uh, it's kind of, kind of dangerous. And... Um, and we uh, plotted all the, 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 the deaths over time in a sort of visual way, so you can see that sort of sparkle map which you saw at the beginning on the first opening slide. But the real, really useful thing that we did, or the really popular thing that we did, other than all the other content, was this interactive, this kind of day, this live day we did where we sent journalists out with uh, paramedics across London's capital to just monitor for one day all the accidents that happened. Um, it was a way of creating a bit of a buzz around the piece um, and uh, to get more people interested in it. Uh, even though it was just London, okay, so that's quite specific, lots of people from further afield were very interested in it too. So we had people, we had journalists out and they were tweeting and they were filing to our live page, which was updated throughout the day. We were plotting the accidents as they happened, interviewing the paramedics um, and the police, and creating, just sort of following and tracking this, and it was hashtag Crash24. Um, it got about 600,000 page views on the day, um, and uh, it was also really good because we hooked up with uh, BBC TV, London TV, and also radio, BBC Radio London. Um, and uh, so it, what it did was it gave our project more legs. So it, the reason, you can spend a very long time working on data projects, and it, I don't, it depends how you want to publicize them and how you want to publish them. But working for uh, maybe uh, a, y a year on something and then it just gets one or two days of exposure, you know, it can seem a bit soul-destroying, actually. So you want to kind of give it, give it uh, legs and, make it, and be able to go back to it and maybe have a product that comes out of it that people can reuse. Um, that's something else which we did. So here are some tips. Um, okay. I've covered most of those, I think. It's the stories, not the numbers. Give your data a human face, please, if you can. Um, investigative journalism takes a lot of time. So work with the people who have the uh, expertise, essentially. Don't go blind into a big data set. Don't go fishing in it. Uh, otherwise, you can spend a lot of time digging around and not really knowing very much. Find people who are going to tell you about that, whether or not it's sources, experts, statisticians, uh, people with a domain knowledge of education, public policy, whatever. Triple check your data. Always, you would never publish a story without having somebody else look at it and sub it, and that's the same for any of your data because there will always be errors. If you... Uh, when you publish data which you have gathered, you're responsible for it. Um, so if it's got errors in, people are going to come back to you. And if you value your reputation 
as a publisher or as a as as a publication, then you have to make sure that's as accurate as possible and you have to be prepared to respond to critics and alter it and change it and staff to cover corrections and feedback. Okay? How am I doing on time? Okay. So moving on, that's data journalism, computer assisted reporting. This is a kind of the visualization data project. Um, the important thing about data visualization, using it to explain a complex issue, is that people, what you're using is you're explain, using the data to explain something to people, to make things simpler for them. What you're not doing is creating a piece of data art, which they'll find very difficult to interpret. You might want to do that, but that's not really journalism, okay? And there's lots of people who do do that. So um, the reason I've got this example, which was one that we did, uh, which was uh, basically trying to show how, uh, how various banks owed money to, how various countries owed money to in other banks across the Eurozone. Um, it was you know, trying to explain how countries are all interrelated and how some countries are much worse off than others. Uh, we were quite surprised because it was very popular with our users. It's not perfect. It's kind of a nice stab at a visualization. You can click on all the countries and see how they relate to the other countries and how much they owe and what that actually means. And what we found was it's a really complex subject that lots of people don't understand and lots of people actually do want to understand it. Uh, you think that maybe your readers might switch off from complex sub subjects, but if you hook them in in the right way that they won't, they won't. When you create things like this, it's very important to monitor whether or not they actually work. So you've got to check where people are clicking, how many people are coming to it, how they're moving through it. We knew that this was doing a fairly good job. We also had a response form on the bottom to get sort of um, verbatim responses as well. But uh, because there were, we've got about 12 clicks per user, and, so, and there's only about 10 slides. So we know that people were moving around it quite a lot. Um, and uh, we also focus grouped it as well later after we'd done it. And we found that people said, oh, I like this because I can, make, I can understand it. It doesn't make me feel stupid. Which is odd, right? Because it's quite complex when you click around it. But what we have found is that in terms of data visualization, people often switch off from traditional representations. It doesn't mean you shouldn't use them, but graphs, bar charts, pie charts, a lot of people, a lot of your readers, uh, don't actually like them because it makes them feel stupid, because it reminds them of maths, which they probably weren't very good at, at school. And this kind of goes to who your readership is, right? If you're, if you're doing things for a kind of more technical audience, then, or, then actually that might be fine. But if you're doing things for a group of people who are much wider readership, then you might want to think about different ways of representing the data. I put this in there because this is one of my favorite uh, kind of data visualizations from the very talented Amanda Cox at the New York Times. And it's several uh, years old now, but it's a really good way of unpacking monolithic data. In a sense, you get one unemployment rate, right? But what she does here is uh, allows various filters, and you can move through the data and see actually uh, unemployment is, is one figure, but actually how it affects individuals with different uh, education levels, essentially. So that's me down there. If I was American, which I'm not, that's my unemployment level when this was done in 2009, the likelihood. And that's uh, the unemployment rate for. Uh, black men who left school without uh, any high school degree. So it's a really interesting way of moving through it. We also tested this with our users, and it didn't do particularly well, interestingly. I thought that was probably because it was an American data set and they wouldn't be interested in it. But it sort of, got to, it sort of goes to the, to the a point that it's kind of a bit complicated and it's a graph, you know. And so you can never please everybody, I'd say. You have to, be, you have to, have to know that. Um, so there you go. There's some data tips. Um, data visualization tips. Uh, keep your user in mind all the time. That's the most important thing with this type of interactive data visualization. You're not normal. None of you in this room are normal. Um, that's important to remember as well. You spend, may spend all day thinking about this sort of thing, but the people who are going to be looking at this will have five minutes in their lunch hour. And uh, they will not be as sophisticated as you are, probably. Some of them will be. And if you're designing for that audience, then that's fine. And you can do a lot more. Um, always test your designs. Uh, you can just do that really simply by taking paper prototypes to any kind of cafe or public space or just with coworkers, um, And iterate on that feedback. So change what you've done after with a response. Um, 
just, just really simple things like circles. People like circles. They like bubbles. They're kind of friendly. It's weird, isn't it? But they do. They bubble along. They're friendly. They don't, they don't say maths, complex statistics people. They, they, just, they just like them. Keep the user interface, the user UX, simple, intuitive. Avoid too many choices. A big kind of go off and explore me thing. It can be nice, but, you, but be aware that you're going to create user anxiety probably unless the UX is really good and you will lose people, they will drop off. And I'm presuming that your ambition is to keep as many people with you on the journey as you can. Um, generally sequential next options, in my experience, get more clicks than explore. And you might want to consider using audio commentary or using video production tools, uh, using After Effects to kind of give intros to things or things that are particularly complex and get an expert to talk over them. Uh, Rosling style, really. Have I got another couple of minutes? Oh, excellent. So here are the tools that we use. I'm not going to talk about those particularly. You'll probably go into that a lot more tomorrow. Um, and one more thing. I'll just do very quickly. The last thing, which I'm not going to talk about much because I'm not sure how interested you are in it, but I'll talk about it. You can talk about it in more detail with me if you are. It's the other data type of data project we do is produce tools for people which give them personal information which is relevant to them. People are basically want to know stuff about themselves at the end of the day. And if you can do that, what you will do is create something which is useful and which is popular. So we have started to do some of these tools. This is a budget calculator uh, where you can put in your salary details and find out, uh, and other information essentially, and find out how much you'll be, you've been affected by the Chancellor's budget. Are you better or worse off? And then you can tweet that information. And actually, a lot of people did. Uh, so previously, we'd not made things particularly social, but now we're doing that much more because everybody likes to share information about themselves. And the, um, lastly, I will leave you with this one, which is another type of tool that we did where you could find out, this was tied to coincide with the date when the UN said that the world population had reached 7 billion. We produced something which, um, from a UN population fund data set, which allowed you to see, uh, uh, find out how many people were alive when you were born. It was really popular, really, really popular. It was a bit of fun. It had other, if you look at it, you'll be able to go see and see that it has other kind of more educational aspects to it. But you could just find your number and tweet it. Okay, and that was, and so that's got 356,000 shares on that and it's got about 10 million page views since we've done it. And it was the most popular thing on Link on UK Facebook in 2011. So sharing stuff really works. It boosts reach, okay and uh, it will get users coming to your site. Thank you very much. <laughs> oh, sorry. Sure. I was trying to be really quick. I know I have too much to say. Thank you.